Great. So uh, this was uh, a new paper that uh, was just posted on BioArchive a couple of days ago. I think Subutai found it, and uh, in its, uh, I read it, and I thought I'd go. I, I didn't give a super deep read on it, but I, um, I read it pretty carefully, and I thought it was very interesting. Um, the title of the paper is "Good Cell Firing Fields in Volumetric Space." Something we've talked about a lot about how how do you represent three D in n-dimensional spaces using grid cells, because the whole thousand brain theory is based on the idea that we're modeling complex spaces, at least 3D, maybe more than that. Um, and, and so the literature on how grid cells represent more than two-dimensional spaces is kind of mixed and, and confusing. So this paper added a lot, I thought, to that. Um, the authors, you can see them here, uh, I guess, out of Kate Jeffrey's lab. Um, I'm going to... Um, I just highlighted some things here and I'll just, I will jump around and talk about the highlighted things, first of all. Uh, this is the first figure. This, uh, you can see highlight in the lower highlight here. Uh, it's basically experimental setup. They have a, a rat that's got, you know, uh, uh, they're recording from grid cells in the rats and you know, the cortex. And the rat spends some time in a typical 2D maze and they characterize uh, the place fields for those grid cells. Then the rat is transferred to this three-dimensional maze, which just looks like a lot of fun to play in, big play structure. And so then they map the receptive fields for those same cells in this three-dimensional maze. And then the rat goes back again, spends some time in the two-dimensional again. So that's the experimental paradigm. And they're recording the cells in all three of those. Uh, the question is, is how do grid fields, I mean, the, if you would be measuring a grid cell, uh, how do its fields respond uh, there's a lot of data we know how good good cell fields are in two-dimensional boxes and mazes not, and there's conflicting data about three-dimensional spaces um so this i'm not sure if this is the first experiment that did a true real grid like a three-dimensional box because there's other experiments where the rats are crawling up walls and ramps and things like that then they this upper figure here is basically uh, suggesting well they're saying you know this is this is like the place fields we see for a grid cell this on the left here uh, number one in a 2D maze. And the question is, what is it like in a 3D maze? You know, what are the, how are the cells uh, responding? What are the fields? What are the good cell fields like? And if you go look at number three here, these are two um, sort of, these are the two uh, well-known, I guess, uh, ways you can optimally stack spheres. Uh, one's, one's called, uh, I forget what these acronyms are for, but um, uh, they're pretty much, uh, the, you can just see the kind of how the different layers are reversing, but this is, these are both optimal stacking mechanisms. Um, but that doesn't, it could be other things. It could be like, there could be columns, like receptive a cell could respond in a column fashion, or it could be random, like here. So, you know, where do cells respond could be random. So these are the, the options that they talked about. But then they record... Um, the animal and and these on the on here on these under G here these these ones on the the first three columns here are the classic grid cell receptive you know field response properties that you see, um, and um, why am I just I, I think I should just go full screen here I haven't done that I'm sorry, um, I don't, you're seeing my buttons you're seeing my stuff on the bottom of the screen here anyway, um, anyway so these are the classic receptive fields that you see. Uh, in um, in almost all grid cell experiments, yeah, as the map moves through the the, the two dimensional um, maze, and you can see different scales of grid cell responses. And these are the actual traces. These are the uh, the different ways they statistically show them. And then they can do the same thing for the three dimensional maze. So they can show where do the rat moves around in the three dimensional maze, where and uh, where do the cells respond. Um, and then they do the same sort of, you know, a clustering analysis on these. And then these over here, they're projecting the three-dimensional volume onto the, onto the edges of the, of the cube. So if you want to project, like you have this big cloud of receptive uh, of fields here, you can project them onto one side or another side or on the bottom, that kind of thing. Um, and already you're going to see, you can start seeing some regularities in this, uh, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. So if there's, any, if there's questions along the way, just let me know. Um, so I just highlighted, I read through the whole thing, but I'm just going to highlight some things that jumped out at me. Um, this first highlight is surprising the number of fields exhibited in the arena and the lattice did not differ, meaning when they total the number of receptive, these grid fields, like where do they find these cells responding, the number of fields in the two-dimensional space was, was the same as the number of fields in the three-dimensional space. So obviously the three-dimensional space 
is going to have different coverage. Um, but it wasn't like there were more fields in the three-dimensional space. It's just like, no, they're just different. Um, so that, that was very interesting. And they say surprising, which is, is true. What, what, um, what does it mean? Of course. How, what does it mean to if have they, more, if they, more fields? Uh, it's still each, well, it's each like, field is a single cell, right? They, they're, uh, let's what, say you're what recording is, what do they mean a, by a field here? What they mean is uh, if you have a single cell and you're recording yeah. from it and you say, okay, well, the rat's running around on the two-dimensional surface, how many different fields and how many different places does that cell respond to? Oh, okay. So it's the four. number of locations it responds to. Yeah. So they, they okay. do this over a population of cells, right? So you do this over a population of cells and you can say, okay, given that population of cells, how many place fields did were, you know, how many grid fields, you know, the blobs that were, you know, the grid, a grid cell responded um, occurred in the two-dimensional maze and then in the three-dimensional maze. Now, three-dimensional maze is the same area, I believe, as the two-dimensional maze. So it's, it's just taller. And so you might think that if you have a, now a three-dimensional volume, you're, you're going to have more place fields in there, like more, there are going to be more places that, you know, you can say, oh, there's going to be, that's going to be tile up. If all, if all place fields were just little cubes, or little spheres, and you had them arranged on the surface of the two-dimensional space, then you go into three-dimensional space, you might think there's, you know, tw you know right. many, many more. But okay, so, so the field is field is basically the number of uh, the number of fields is the number of distinct locations that the cells responded basically yes. the total a number single, of them. a single cell okay. or a group of you know, or a group of cells okay, right? okay. so so something has to give there so the second highlight is says grid cell grid field radius meaning the size of the, re, the the place where that cell responded was significantly larger in the labs all right compared to the arena the arena is the two-dimensional space so they're saying okay well there's the same number of fields but these fields are bigger now Right. And they also here, the, the next one is they also exhibit a significantly larger spacing. So they're much more spread out between them, which makes sense too. Um, but, but one could, you didn't have to have both of those. Right. But so there were bigger fields response, bigger fields, and they're more widely spaced out. Is that, is that clear? Yeah. All right. yeah. Okay. Um, there's a lot of figures here. Not much of the figures in this paper are, just proving statistically, uh, you know, um, the, what they're claiming is true. <laughs> and so, um, so I, you know, the whole field of grid cells and, and neural recording in general has progressed over the years to be very, very statistically driven to prove that your results are not, you know, are correct. And so I'm not going to go through all those things. Um, but, uh, but I just wanted to um, um, point out that this figure is a lot, mostly it's that kind of stuff. But the, the point of this figure is so the grid cells map the lattice with large and widely spaced, but stable fields. So that's, we just already talked about that. They're large, they're widely spaced, but they're stable, meaning that the same cells respond in the same spot every time. So it's, that's what you would expect from a grid cell, but they just wanna make sure that's the case, right? You know, the whole point is the grid cell is always supposed to respond we're never in some location. Well, that's happening here too. This, this I highlighted this figure J here, cause I thought it was, they just threw this in and I thought it was a little bit odd that they didn't talk about it a little bit more and it was a little confusing to me. It, it, and, and so th this, is the, this is the text, it says, the grid cell spacing in the arena and the lattice was uncorrelated. Um, okay, and arena grid modules, the bottom histogram here were just disrupted, disrupted in the lattice. So what they're showing here, I believe, is they're showing the spacing between grid cell, a population of grid cells and what their ideal spacing is. So like, oh, this may be 35 centimeters, something like that here. Well, and this one may be like 70 centimeters, something like that. Um, and they show this, they call this disrupted. I'm not sure why. They, to me, I thought these are like two separate grid cell modules. It's like, that's what I expect to see. I would expect to see some cells that are responding at one uh, spacing and a bunch of other cells responding at another spacing. And that's kind of in the realm of what we might see for two grid cell modules, but they didn't make that connection. They 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 just they just basically labeled in a weird way. Well, so I, I, I think might, maybe if I can say so if, yeah, if the x-axis is the spacing in the arena, so yeah. you 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 know there's like let's say two different spacings that they're seeing here. The y-axis is the spacing in the lattice and. If there were two distinct spacings in the arena, you might expect two distinct spacings in the lattice, but you don't. See yeah, that. well, but more, they, maybe that's what I, they mean by disruptive. I, I, I think that's what they mean by disruptive. I think I got that, but they didn't point out to me, which is odd, that this would be almost what you'd expect 
to see because of two modules, right? If I had, if I was recording cells from two different modules, I would expect to see this kind of bifurcation here. That's normal, right? It's like, oh yeah, these cells, these, this secrets are module respond to this sizing and this secrets are module. But then, but then they say, well, that's not occurring here, but, but this is also, I, I just really intrigued by this picture because this, this distribution here in the, in the wide dimension, it almost looks like it's, it's like two separate things that are bumping into each other, right? It's almost like two peaks that are very close. Like you got this little dip in the middle here. And uh, anyway, I thought this is, this is one of those uh, figures where you look at it and go, hmm, I wonder, if, maybe there's something here. I, you know, I, I just didn't want to forget this. <laughs> it's like, this is interesting. Um, and I don't, I thought their interpretation was too quick. It's like, well, that, that's a, I thought there was an interesting clue and I didn't understand it. And, yeah, it uh, might've been nice if they look at just like this set of cells and yeah. plot the histogram here just for that set. Um, you know, yeah, maybe like yeah, you're saying exactly. that, you know, that might look differently than the exactly history. right because it does look, this set here almost looks like it's bifurcated, but they're bumping up into one another, right? And and so, yeah, because you can almost see like the mean of this one is here and the mean of that one is here, it's like, yeah, two separate, yeah. Uh, things. so yeah. I thought this this was given this the whole point of this paper is like, well, what are these stuff are these spacings are like? This one was like, hey, you should have spent more time on that, I think. Um, I, I wonder if it's in the supplementary material. Well, we they could didn't. even ask the person this. Yeah, uh, he's on, I, I they, don't know if you've seen it. If you looked at his Twitter thread, it's actually a really nice. I saw it briefly, but I didn't. I didn't read it. Bef I haven't read it carefully. I just figured I'd read the paper first, and I haven't gone back and read it. Anyway, there is a supplemental figure six for you know maybe. Anyway, I I didn't get there. I didn't read any of the supplemental material. I apologize for that. But um, I just thought there's a, so maybe they addressed it here, but this just jumped right out at me like, whoa, that's an interesting result. Why didn't they talk about that more? <laughs> so, um, um, it just just a comment. If if I took those two sequence, those two histograms, and I correlated against each other, there is a very poor correlation between them, where you have you have you have they're almost they're not even anti-correlated, where you have dips and you have uh, peaks on uh, from one to the other. So I. You know, if, if you expected that there was going to be some kind of stable relationship, no matter, you know, which dimension, oh, which uh, two or three dimensions that you had, uh, they, they, they look like they're trying to, it's almost like they're being repurposed to represent something else. I didn't, I didn't follow that, Kevin, but it may be, I don't well, know if you, if, say, if you, look I don't at, if you say it again, I'll understand it. If, if, you look at the, <laughs> if you look at the 50 centimeter point, you see there's a dip there. Yeah. And you look on the other one and uh, there's almost a, a peak around the 50. Yeah. Okay. No, I, so wait, if you but, multiply those functions against each other, they're, they're, they're. Okay. They're, they're, so, they're, so I'm not expecting that I would not, in fact, the whole paper is that these vertical spacings are really different and weird. So I'm not expecting there to be a bump at 50, um, but whatever the bump is, it's interesting. I mean, it, it, this almost looks like there's two bumps, one around 70 and one around 80 or something like that. Uh, and um, I'm not expecting it to be these to be the same. I'm not, I mean, you might have, you might've come in here saying, oh, we're gonna have these vertical uh, spacing of the grid cells. It's gonna be a nice cubic, you know, that was, that was the idea of this ideally packed spherical array. Then you would expect to see the, the um, this uh, spacing to be equivalent all the you know these different dimensions, but we know that's not the case. Uh, so the question now is like, what is it? And I and I think this is just showing. I think you're right. There's this is saying, hey, it's, this it says it's not just a nice vertical, peak. you know, it's not just a, a stack bunch of stack spheres that are ideally stacked. Um, if that's what you're saying, Kevin. I agree. That's, it tells it's not that way. Yeah. But it, but there is some structure here. I think it's more than that was worthy of investigating. Well, yeah, uh, but I, I'm just coming coming to the, the their disrupted point is basically whatever the ordering was in on the in the 2D is uh, there's not a there's not a uh, a simple or obvious mapping to how it went to 3D. Yeah, I know, but it, I, I don't think it's random either. So it, it, anyway, I no, just, no, no, I, no. It didn't yeah. say it had to be random. Yeah. It just yeah. says something else is occurring. Yeah, yeah. So I thought I thought this figure was suggestive enough. Especially, this is almost looks like two peaks here. I just thought it was like I just thought, as I'm trying to understand this, I, I I'll, every once in a while I might come back and think about that. That's it's really a sort of a tangent. Then this this figure here um, is titled "Grid Cells." Grid fields were randomly distributed in the labs, so they looked at different statistical ways you could try to figure out how the grid fields might be distributed, 
And so I highlight up here, the, the first two of these are, well, they, they say these are actual, the first thing here is actual grid cells. The, sec, the next one here, this HCP and the FCC are the two uh, ideal hexagonal stacking methods. Then there's the column method, which is like, oh, what if they just, these fields are all stacked on top of one another, like a, a cell responds in the same spot, but vertically in the column. And then the fourth one is random, as if, you know, there's no, there's no structure uh, to where these fields occur. And so the point of this um, figure and a bunch of data here is that the data looks like the fields are random. <laughs> that's, that's what they're showing in various, um, uh, various uh, points in this, in this figure here. Um, and uh, so that's just an interesting observation. They just appear to be randomly, you know, bouncing around inside of this, you know, inside of this uh, lattice. Well, um, I, would, I don't know if they could, I'm just curious about kind of Marcus and Mirko's stuff and what, whether this could be consistent with, with that kind of a formalism. Because that one, if I understand it, you'd have a bunch of random projections from 2D to 3D. Um, so you say but that look. projection would be consistent within a module, right? Each module um, would have a fixed, completely random projection. Um, so it might look random, but all of the, if you were yeah. to try to figure out what that mapping is, it would be fixed for all cells in a module. Would that, I, I mean, Marcus, you can answer this question. My thing is the, the, all the modules in, in your paper, Marcus, were 2D modules, right? And, and or they were they modules, I can't remember. 2D. Okay, 2D modules. And therefore, you just basically have you were doing the grid cell trick in in uh, to another level. So I would have thought that you would have predicted that the spacings would be not random. But what, what do you think? Well, no, we uh, the, the mapping to here is we would do, uh, that that paper would predict something like the column uh, approach, except that the columns aren't necessarily vertical; they can be diagonal. They could be any. Yeah, exactly. Oh, so well, that would. And the question is, would they have caught that here uh, if that was the case? Uh, I think it's likely they would have visually caught that. They would have, by looking at the firing fields, they would have no noticed this distinctive diagonal column. Mm -hmm. I don't know if their statistical technique right in this particular figure would have caught that, but yeah. they're aware of the model. I mean, they, they cite it and they, yeah. they, they know about it. Yeah, so, I'll, come, um, I'll come back to it later because when yeah. they wrote about it, I didn't understand what they said about it. So you can help me on that one. Well, that's it's an interesting question. I mean, now that now that I think about it, reading through this paper, I you would think, oh, maybe it would be obvious that there was these like you know columns of different diagonals. Well, I guess, but it's not clear. That, it's not clear they would have seen that because I think almost all of this was done statistically. I mean, they're running all this data through these algorithms to try to figure things out, and I'm not um, sure. Well, their earlier image might have shown it. Um, you know, the ones you were showing where they were projecting it along each dimension. Yeah, let's go back there. Well, like here. I mean, uh, yeah, they, right there, you you might have seen it. They didn't. I mean, they do them. see. They do. They, you kind of see stripes. Yeah, but, I know. I know. I see that here. Um, and you see diagonals right the, at the bottom one there. Yeah. Um, uh, it's so interesting. if you look look here, for example, it's diagonal. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Well, this is um, this would be the. And these are kind of diagonal lines here. These this are is diagonal. The, this lines. is the projection on the on the bottom surface of the lattice. So that looks like a traditional. Down here, this. Uh, this would be like the, the, the classic 2D uh, grid cell in a, in a maze. Um, and this is a volumetric extension where these look like sort of column-like. Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, it seems like it's not immediately clear. It's inconsistent with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Theory. Um, what what the, the trick would be, I think, in the, the real key in Marcus and Marcos thing is that every cell in the module has that same projection, right? Uh, and I don't know if their data can actually tell that. Um, mm. And that would be pretty interesting to see. We need the same Regardless data. of what the mapping is, you know, there's some, there's some, you know, random, uh, the cells are distributed somehow randomly in 3D space. Uh, but is that, cons is that distribution sort of constant for all the cells in a module? Is it the same kind of random mapping? I think that would be pretty interesting. Well, is it random? I mean, it, I mean, what I'm hearing it's, from- it's, done, it's random, but fixed. I guess well, it doesn't have to be okay. random, well, but it has to be What different. this paper says is random and fixed. But but the question, and this is this is like it's gonna to get to the key conclusion of this paper. So I think it's an important but, but, point. But it only says it only says that for a given cell. It doesn't say that all the cells in a module have the same random fixed mapping. And I think that's kind of what do you mean, mean the, the same. I mean, oh I see. They would have the same just like every cell in a 2D 
grid cell module has the same um, yeah. offset and orientation and things like that. Yeah, in order to get these nice coding properties in n-dimensional spaces, I think you have to have that. And correct me if I'm wrong, Marcus, but that's, right. that's key to it. Um, well, let me go back to this question. If, 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 if it was working the way, one of the conclusions I reached in this paper that the projection, we're gonna to get to in a moment, the projection, on, if you project down onto the 2D surface, as in this figure here, you see much more like you traditionally see for a, um, a grid cell module. That is, you, they're, they're, they're gonna argue at the end of the paper, not in this figure, but at the end of the paper, they're gonna argue that the fields are sort of random up here and they're elongated in a way that we haven't talked about yet. Um, but if you project them all down onto the, onto the bottom surface, it's going to look more like a traditional 2D. It's like a, the, what we think of as a grid cell module is really a projection of a, of a higher dimensional space, which is something I've been toying around with and arguing for a while too. So um, the question is, is it really random up here or is it it's just, just they didn't see the structure because they weren't looking at it the right way? Um, and so I think the point of your, Marcus, what you're saying and Subitai is that if it was the way you guys proposed in that paper, then it wouldn't be random, right? It, 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 it would, it might, it might appear random at any, but it, it actually the structure there, right? It's some random direction, but it's fixed. It, it's a random fixed projection. Yeah, but but module. but in that direction, there's rep repetition, or yeah. there's yeah, yeah. Right? So that's not the same as being random. Uh, right. I, I guess here's the here's the other the key question for me is, you know, we we. And Marcus, I guess we'll talk about this other paper too. But you know, the theory is that any grid cell, one grid cell module doesn't give you unique location, but multiple modules together give you a unique location, right? Yeah. And so, can you extrapolate that property to three dimensions, right? Can you uh, now, when you have you, you have all of this, you know, some random mapping of the cells into three D, but can you still? get unique 3D location. Well, if every module is mapping. But if every module is doing path integration, then it would work, right? Yeah, but every cell in the module has to do this, has to behave the same way in 3D. Yeah. So you know, you'll see at the end of this, at the end of this paper, they are going to question the whole concept of, uh, of that you can do path integration over 3D spaces using the methods that people are thinking about. That is, they're going to say that these fields are, there isn't a regular structure to the grid cells, and therefore uh, path integration can't really work over long. No, distance. that's not correct. You can have an irregular structure as long as it's consistent for each module. Um, I'm just pointing out that that's the conclusion I think they're going to reach at the end here. Or at least yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that that conclusion they're reaching. Well, is, I, I is guess okay. Let's uh, let's come back to that because I'm I'm really I'm I'm still a little bit confused by your comments because. You know, on the one hand, I thought, like, if you think about the paper you wrote with, uh, uh, with Marco, um, it's like, okay, there's a bunch of these 2D grid cell modules. They're just like every other 2D grid cell module, but they're at different orientations in space. And therefore, together, they work, right? Is that the basic? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, great. I love it. And, uh, but they're still regular grid cell modules. You just have to think about them as being planes in some 3D space. Well, um, one of the things that bothers me about their the diagrams where they're trying to uh, get chi coefficients out there. I mean, they're trying to fit a couple of 3D, classic 3D close packing um, structures to it. And, but they, but they, they have no provision for that the projection could be at some angle or others. It's basically, does it fit orthogonally, you know, in the direction that we've, we've tried to correlate it. And it, it bothers me that, yeah, I, I think it was pointed out that the, the there's no, uh, uh, you know, there's no provision that, you know, gee, that structure could look like stripes if you just look at it from the right angle. Or well, this. so I, so Kevin, you might be right about that. I don't under, I didn't read the care, paper carefully enough to make uh, and understand the statistical methods enough personally to say, that they wouldn't have caught those other things. Um, so well, I, don't, I don't know if you've been reading it here and, and, or read it and, and you conclude, I, they may, they, they, the authors may come back and say, oh no, we would have caught that. Um, I don't know that. I mean, it's not being visible, it's shown here, but. Um, well, so just, I, in the, I, just in the graphs that they've shown, there's not sufficient dimensionality to re represent that. That's okay, all. so I guess the, the question is, the methods they use, which are all statistical methods that most of them I'm not familiar with, um, to determine 
these this issue, um, would they have caught uh, that sort of regularity that we're talking about? Or is it truly random as they claim? Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I just don't know. I don't know enough about the mathematics they used to do this to, to make that. Um, yeah, I, I'm just thinking of the fact that if you take 3D and compress it down to 2D using a SOM, you're not necessarily going to get the structure, you know, the, the clean structures yeah. they're talking well, about. Well, I don't, again, they're using, they're not just projecting and saying, what does it look like? They're doing various techniques to talk to that measure grittiness and, and they're all statistical. I'm just, I don't know what those are. So okay. um, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to conclude that they did or didn't do something. Um, I already pointed out these comments earlier. I said, surprisingly, the number of fields exhibited in the arena uh, did not differ. Um, and so you had fewer grid cell modules in the lattice per square cubic millimeter than you did in the arenas. Uh, and the radius was significantly larger and, and they had significantly larger spacing in the lattice. Okay. Uh, we already did this one. Oh yeah, we already down here. We already did all this here. I'm getting lost. Um, I, I don't know if you finished describing your version of Marcus's paper, your understanding of it. You were in the middle of it when- uh, I think I did. I mean, so. I mean, you know, I have a sort of basic understanding of it, but um, my understanding that we just, we're just taking grid cell modules and all the property grid cell modules, but if we just assume they're not all coplanar and they're at different angles to one another, then you would be able to map three-dimensional spaces. Um, and, but all the properties of path integration would work just fine, right? I did never, I never asked myself what, it would, you know, if I were measuring an individual cell, you know, um, you know, I, you know, I guess, you know, what would it do in other, you know, in within the plane of a projection, that cell, that cell would be just like a grid cell, right? In that plane of whatever that plane is. And would that cell ever fire in other planes, in other modules? I guess not. I mean, Marcus, you tell me. Um, uh, I guess I, I, it, the connection between what they're showing here and what that what your paper is I hadn't thought about it. Is, it's not a hundred percent clear to me, um, but it seems like that your paper says, "Oh, it's not random at all. It's these are well-defined grid cell modules are just different angles to each other." Well, the, no, the, in ours they could all be coplanar. The the they, uh, the it could be hexagonal on the plane. All of the modules can be hexagons on the same plane. The big question is, as you go up in the third dimension, what happens? And and they could shoot, if one module shoots off in one angle with columns in one angle, one direction, another module shoots off in another direction, great, it works. It, it but why would they, but, but, but if, if I just think of, of space is without any boundaries on it, well, why would it, why would I expect it to be like, a you know, all coplanar at one point and then not coplanar at another point? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't a, a module be at some angle to the other modules throughout all the space? Why would it be? I think that's what Marcus said, right? But no, Marcus, you just said that all the modules could look hexagonal on, on the base plane or something like that. Is that what you said yeah. or no? Yes. Um, and, and then as you move in the up direction, the question is how does each module update its phase as you move up? But why- and As it, long as- but that's if I don't assume there's a preferential bottom plane, wouldn't they just wouldn't I just think of these grid cell modules as different just forever being at some angle to each other? And yeah. therefore, but then but then they wouldn't project in a hexagonal array, both of them on this on the same hexagonal array. I, I guess I'm missing something. No, no, they wouldn't be on the same. There'll be some each one will the, be at some random direction to one another. They're hexagonal on the same um on the same plane. You can I mean, have a bunch why, of modules why would they be hexagonal, hexagonal on the same plane? plane? Wouldn't they be if I took, if I had a, I had a, if I had a plane uh, going up some 45 degree angles and it was hex, it's hexagonal on that plane, but if I project it down onto an, a base plane, which is horizontal, then I wouldn't have a regular hexagonal projection, right? I'd have a squished projection. Um, I'm missing something. I, I'm not understanding something. I mean, uh, I, the, the thing I'm questioning is whether it's the thing we should be focusing on right now. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 like it's, it's diving into the details of the different types of projections you can do. Yes, we you can limit yourself to the types of projections you're talking about, but that's not all of them. And you, there are ones you can do where you're what's the oblique oblique projections allow you to have um, ha, allow you to have everything share the same plane, but be projected in different angles. The question is whether you allow pro oblique projections or not. 
but this is diving deep into the details of a different paper that I don't think are fundamental to. Okay. To well, well, I'm just trying to understand whether these results could be consistent with that. Uh, I, like, I think the I end think of the it could be. But let's uh, get to the end of the paper because the end of the paper, I've got some highlighted things, which I think get back to the question we're talking about here. So, and your papers represent the end of the paper. Um, this, this figure four, is, these figures are pretty well described, descriptive. Grid, cell, grid fields in the lattice were vertically elongated and some form diagonal columns. So, so I, this will, some of these figures I didn't get, but you know, A just says, you know, instead of being a, a sphere, it, it, you know, it's elongated in some dimension, right? And what they showed is that, um, uh, that they, that in this, there would seem to be this sort of vertical elongation um, uh, that occurred to these uh, in the lattice. Um, and which is odd because then that, that sort of suggests that, yeah, there is this ground plane, which is preferential. And then above the ground plane, you know, you have these vertical things. And it, it could also be that even in the ground plane that the, the cells are elongated. We just don't normally see it because the, 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 you know, the, the, the rat is running around on two dimensions and it's just cross-sectioning this big sort of oval thing in, in, in half. So. Um, but anyway, the, this was another observation that these fields are vertically elongated. Um, and the hexagonal columns thing, I, I need to go back and read that again. It was confusing to me. But this I've high, this is my highlight here on, on D, where they were showing um, these, uh, these, these blue things are the different um, uh, you know, rate maps of the cells firing. And then they projected it down onto the XY plane so they were saying, hey, these are like random up here, but when I project them down to the XY plane, it's like hexagonal columns. <laughs> so it's like hexagonal array. So again, this gets back to the idea that you have a, that what we see, this, this gets back to the idea that, you know, there's some, that, that there's a sort of a, a projection um, of in, in volumetric, in 3D space down onto a 2D plane and 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 it's not the 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 the, uh, the space is not um, isometric in all dimensions. You know, it's it's got some preferential planes to it. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, it's like it's like maybe maybe he said, oh, nature started by saying, hey, I have this two dimensional grid cell array, uh, but I need to represent three dimensional spaces. So we're going to do that somehow by extending these things up in these columns in these elongated receptive fields. Uh, it's hard to interpret what this all means, and I I just think that that's their observation. Um, um, so I don't know if there's questions about that. Well, one of the things they showed when they, they showed those uh, uh, projections onto the faces of the cube is that at different uh, frequencies, you get different, you know, mappings onto there. And so when you look at this thing, when you see that those, those twisted uh, uh, structures have a frequency component to them where it's, it's localized in, in the uh, in the higher frequencies uh, more tightly than it is in the lower frequencies. Uh, it, it kind of implies that when you're, when you're kind of moving up in say that other dimension, you might, might have frequency coding contributing another dimension to the thing. I, I don't know what you mean by frequency coding. Um... Well, you look at the, the D there, that's basically Hertz. That's frequency, that's firing rate. Yeah. So you notice over there that the red is the highest firing rate and it's those little tips of those things. Yeah, they're just what this is. This is the standard way of showing um, a rate map, right? You're just trying to show where the center, the color indicates where the center of the field was, right? That's right. the number of spikes per second. Roughly. Yeah, yeah, right. So I'm, what I'm what I'm suggesting is is that they they might be using the firing rate as as another dimension. Well, In, I don't know. I don't. I don't, um, I don't think way, so. I, I don't think I don't so either. Think so. It's basically just saying as the cell approaches, it's it's uh, as you as the animal approaches the the, re, the firing field for the cell, the grid field for the cell, that the cell starts firing slowly, and then when it gets closer, it starts firing more rapidly, and then it starts moving away, it starts firing slowly again. By the way, the, elsewhere in the paper, I, maybe I highlight it later that they point out that the all the other things you expect to see with grid cells, like the theta precession, um, that, that happens here as well, phase precession um, in these cells. But anyway, I, I don't. I, I'm not sure. I think I don't think I'm not sure your interpretation, Kevin. I, I think you're just pointing out this is a classic way of representing where. Okay. So, but did you know the difference in the pattern uh, as a function of firing rate in that in the you know, three slides up? 
uh, three slides up, up, like up here, or three figures up. Yeah. Like, uh, oh, this one here. You know, we uh, we shouldn't interpret this too much. They didn't talk about this much at all. <laughs> they just said, oh, this is just like we do this over here. We can do mm -hmm. it over here. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm just noticing it. Uh, the uh, the uh, top row is at 33.5 uh, hertz. The next one is at 23.8 hertz, and then. Uh, the bottom one is at uh, what is it? Where are you reading these words here? Uh, under rate map. In this figure here. Yeah, figure? in this figure here. Do you see thirty-one point three, twenty-three point eight? Oh, right here. Yeah, right here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what does that mean? These are. I think these are just different uh, spatial frequencies, right? These are uh, like a larger grid cell module, medium and smaller, right? These are. Um, are they spatial frequencies or are they uh, theta values, theta frequency? Values? Uh, I I would. Don't know, but I think this is a standard grid cell picture stuff. So I would assume usually, usually it indicates the max. It's the, the it's showing what is red. Uh, the color red and the top one is. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Okay. Oh, it's, uh, it's, it's a threshold. You're saying it's yeah. just a it's a threshold by which they. Yeah. Oh, it's okay, just so, yeah. It's just labeling their scale, their color scale. One okay, thing so about so uh, the one thing map, about like Hertz's uh, uh, about frequencies like. When you deal, when you look at these rate maps, it's like an average over a five minute trial or longer and Hertz, uh, like they call it a Hertz, but you can't interpret it as a firing rate. You you really need to interpret it more as a probability that the cell fires at that location. Yeah, and, that's right. Uh, because sometimes it might be there firing a lot. Other times it not, might not fire at all. This is just an average of mm. whether it fired or not. So like thinking of it as a you don't have enough observability into the system to know if the firing rate is actually ever high or if it just reliably fires once when the, I when see. the rat that, is that's there. a good distinction actually yeah. that's a really good distinction yeah thank you for making that distinction you know it's interesting uh, we, we've we've talked about that issue before that these things are you know these are time averages you say um what's interesting about that is that um you there's two ways you can interpret that you could say like oh when the cell fires actually means something you know, like this is cell is firing now is like in some context, the cell fires here and it's meaningful. Or you could just say the whole system is fairly unreliable and, and it's probabilistic, in which case then you need to have a fair number of good cells um, that are sharing that, you know, a, great, a fair number of good cell modules or cells that are sharing that receptive field or that, uh, that grid field to make it uh, make it readable, right? If, if, it, if, they're prob if there's a widespread to the probability cells going to fire, then I have to have a whole bunch of them to, um, to, to get a reliable readout. Um, uh, or you could maybe someone could argue, oh no, it's actually something very precise. And that cell's not firing this time because um, you remember the, the that picture I always like from the tank paper where that's where I first saw it, but it was, it was published elsewhere first, that grid cells will sometimes reliably not fire in certain locations. You know, reliably. Every time this cell on this location where you'd expect it to fire does not fire. And it fires every place else. So that that could that was that wasn't just a probability. I was like, no, this thing is telling you something. This is reliably not firing in this location and reliably firing in another location. So that would argue that perhaps this, um, you know, this it's not really a probability. There might be encoding something, you know. Does that make sense? So we, we can't tell from sampling error from actual uh, 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 function following form type of thing is, is, is what I'm hearing from Marcus's distinction on there. But it could be there, but you can't necessarily conclude it. Is, is, is that fair? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let me just, I, I'm going to, let's go through these different text things here. I thought were useful. So just remind you, grid fields were significantly more elongated in the lattice than the arena. So that was just an observation that these, these, these cells, these fields stretch out and they're no longer like spherical. They're, they're like stretched out. Um, they also said they found evidence for square firing patterns was observed in some grid cells. Now, this is interesting because we've talked about different grid cell mechanisms and what, what you know, how grid cells are derived. And, and there's some situations where you might get a square pattern, not a hexagonal pattern. So they're observing that in some cells. So that was a nice little clue there. And then here's the summary of the paper. I just, I just sort of tacked together the words that I think some other readers just highlighted, which in summary, Grid fields formed random configurations, they call them random, of slightly vertically, now they say slightly vertically <laughs> elongated fields. Theta, head direction, speed coding, spike dynamics, and spatial information properties 
were largely preserved in the lattice maze. I don't know what space, I mean, I don't know what that all means, but, but the thing I picked up is this head direction, theta coding, um, and um, some of these are all preserved. Um, so they didn't, these cells didn't observe, behave like different than other grid cells. However, field size and spacing increased while speed scores decreased. This, I was confused by this. Um, and they claim, I guess this is a, a phenomenon that's no. So um, um, they're, they're basically correlating speed of movement with field size. Uh, and then they said the grid cell modules broke down um, uh, findings reminiscent of those on vertical, uh, seen on vertical surface. A failure to integrate speed, um, the distance travel may explain these results. It may uh, be why place cells were not disrupted in the same maze. So there, it's, it's, this is something I didn't, I didn't follow this reference here. I probably should number 10. Um, but they're pointing out that this, the sort of path integration component here is, is tied to speed of movement. And at some speeds, the whole thing fails. Uh, and we, if, if we want to do a little bit of introspection, it might be something like, um, uh, I don't want to get too much on this, but you know, imagine you were climbing through a maze of some sort and you started going really fast. Uh, well, you might get lost. <laughs> you know, just like you didn't have time to check your, check your, uh, your bearings and, and visually see where you are, something like that. But anyway, they had it in there in the summary. And I was like, oh, that's weird. Um, uh, alternative explanations for column of firing fields could, so they, again, now they're going back to this column of firing fields um, that, 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 um, that you, you, a cell, if you take its different positions where it, fire, it fires in vertical space, they kind of line up even though they're not equally spaced up there. Alternative explanations for common firing fields include behavioral biases for horizontal movements, uh, or that overlapping columns represent an efficient way to map higher dimensional space. And 19 is your column, it's your paper. <laughs> so that's, this is the reference to the Klukas and Lewis paper. Um, so I don't know if you want to comment on that. I didn't, I didn't understand this, Marcus. It said that overlapping columns represent an efficient way to map higher dimensional space. Overlapping columns? I didn't understand what that meant. Do you know what that means? Well, sure. Just that the we say that the firing fields are columns moving up in different diagonal directions. And but at, the, at the diagonal directions. But here, I think they were saying they're vertical. Um, that is, they're all like vertically oriented. They weren't. They weren't in different directions. But th that wouldn't then. Over, then you wouldn't have overlapping if they were all vertical. Oh, well, that's interesting. So maybe is it possible that they were just assuming that they're going to be vertical uh, somehow? Let's just go this way for a second. And and there they say, well, they're not really vertical, but they're overlapping. They're overlapping, but um, but that's what you'd see if they if they were slightly off in vertical. I mean, if they're if they're really at some super oblique angle, then they wouldn't be viewed as overlapping columns. They would be viewed as just like you know lines going across the surface. It would, you know, what I'm saying, if it's if it was a perfectly vertical column, it'd be a point. And then if it's like, then if they were all slightly tilting in different directions, then those columns would be overlapping. But if they were all getting a really all these oblique angles, you wouldn't see that. Um, is that is that a correct interpretation? I mean, I think that their sentence is correct and they just met, tried to find a way to compress an entire idea down into one sentence uh, <laughs> it, where it like expressed as a couple sentences, it might've been clearer, but I mean, it's just what you have to do when writing a paper. Strictly speaking, they are kind of getting at the essence of, of, the, of it when they say, um, if you have two grid cell modules that each have diagonal columns pointing off in different directions, that gives you overlapping columns. The, 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 the two, the two yeah. grid cell modules, their columns now overlap. You now have a 3D location code. They managed to compress something down into like 20 words. Uh, and, and that might be why it's confusing because mm. they just compressed it to that. Mm. I guess the thing that was confusing to me is that uh, the impression I got uh, was that they came up this column thing because they said, look, if we just look at the, the base plane, uh, we'll see that the, cell, the a cells, different fields that are sort of randomly distributed above it are, are in sort of a column. And uh, even though they're not equally spaced in that column. Um, so they were working, I believe they were working on that assumption uh, that, okay, it looks like these are all projecting down to a 2D plane, as opposed to all these grid cell modules could be, you know, uh, and, and so they're trying to fit it into that. Because if, if I had a bunch of grid cell modules that were at, you know, 60 degrees oblique to the surface or to the surface, 
or, or, or it's 45 degrees, something like that, they wouldn't have seen that projection onto the bottom plane, right? It, would be like, it wouldn't be as obvious. Um, am I, am right, I no, that, that's yeah. true, that's true. So, so I, it's, it's consistent, but it might tell you something about your model. It might tell you that, well, these planes are not orthogonal to one another. Maybe they're, they're just slightly, slightly off. Right, it's be. Oh, this makes sense too. Imagine I imagine I have if I if I'm doing this correct. Imagine I have a couple of good cell modules with a cell which are like. I got to read your paper again. I'm sorry, but you were talking about the, the cells respond in a column of fashion, off uh, uh, orthogonal to the plane of the of the grid. Is that right? Yeah, that's the firing fields. Yeah. Okay. So now imagine if I now tilt one of those planes slightly to the other one. What I would get now, I have now I have an intersection of two grid cell modules. And these columns are now intersecting at a slight angle. What you would see is you'd see elongated fields vertically, because if I just have two planes that are those two, those two uh, columns are intersecting, the intersection would be an elongated uh, uh, space. Um, and, um, and, uh, and then, I, so this would be consistent with your model where the, where the multiple good cell modules are off by just a slight angle, not off by a, a big angle that they, they could all be just tilted slightly. Does that make sense? That's consistent with their paper. Yeah, so I'm saying that's they don't have to be They don't have to be orthogonal. They just have to be at yes. angles. But this is, they just it, can't all be the same angle. So their, their paper would suggest that your model, that's how it works. Because you'd see these elongated vertical fields and you'd see this column of projection back down to the base plane. Yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to say earlier. Exactly. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, but it, it could be you know all these random elongations. That's fine. But the elongation has to be consistent within all the cells in a module. Otherwise, path integration doesn't work. That's I think that's the key. So, so issue, this which is, I don't think they they're uh, I don't think they can test that in this. Well, experiment. let's go down to this next this, this last big block of text here. So their their paper suggests that place cells and spatial mapping can function when grid cells are irregular. Um, meaning they're saying grid cells are irregular. They're not. They're, they're saying these are not regular patterns that they're firing. Meaning, I interpret this meaning they're saying path integration is not working throughout grid cell modules. Um, place cells do not uh, require, that, that, let me just go through my interpretation of this. Place cells do not require grid cell input for positioning when visual clues are available. Meaning like, okay, it doesn't matter how, how, the, how the grid cells are working. As long as I get good visual clues, I can know where I am, which is, we know that's true. Grid cell inputs may not need to be regular to support place cells. I guess, again, regular meaning path integration wouldn't work everywhere. That's how I interpret that. The grid symmetry is that, is seen that in the what regular means? Uh, I thought uh, regular would mean like a regular hexagonal pattern. Well, if, if, they're, if they're not in some metric, well, I don't, I don't know what you mean. I mean, to me, yeah, they would be not in hexagonal. They, they just, Regular means to me, I, I interpret that meaning it's it's like um, the, 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 the firing fields of an individual cell um, uh, are not regularly spaced. I mean, this, can we just, let's just finish this off. Yeah, yeah, keep going, yeah. Uh, well, this, is the, this is the last thing I've got here, and this is the end of it, yeah. Um, so, you know, um, grid cell in inputs may not need to be regular to put support to play cells. The grid symmetry seen in the laboratory, again, what undefined, the grid symmetry seen in the laboratory may be a consequence of the symmetric geometry and homogeneous behavior of laboratory settings. Meaning in, um, they're saying in, in, in more realistic settings like this 3D setting, maybe this symmetry of grid cell firing and the regularness of it isn't true. It invites a reappraisal of the computational um, comp contributions that grid cells make to spatial mapping, suggesting that any metric combination contribution of grid cells to spatial localization must arise from the statistics of the dispersal rather than their precise arrangement. And I don't know what the statistics of the dispersal would help you in some sense, but I interpreted this paragraph to say like, you know what, we got to rethink how grid cells work. They're not metric in this, in this strict way, and they may not be able to do path integration in, as we think of them. Um, that's how I interpret their, 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 um, their paragraph here. 
Um, but I'm not sure their data supports that. Okay, well, I guess now that would get down into the details. We'd have to look more carefully at how they did their statistical analysis. I find it very intriguing, which is really, really interesting today, that I, I get a better understanding of how the Marcus Your uh, and, and Mirko's paper could solve this, could be consistent with this. Um, if um, it's it's really interesting, you know, what 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 we're saying here is let me let's go back to this. Like either these planes are just slightly tilted to one another, and then there are these columns that are now intersecting at a slight angle. Um, uh, if I were to measure the, if I were to say, oh, the receptive field is elongated, that would be a, a cell that's at the intersection, that, a cell that's getting input from those two, from two other grid cells. It's like a cell that's being, that's getting, it's, it's firing at the coincidence of the, of, of cells in these two planar projections or these two columnar projections. That cell would look like it has a receptive, elongated receptive field. Yeah. Um, but that's not technically a grid cell anymore. That's the coincidence of two grid cells. Right. So, or, or it's a coincidence of two other cells that have gritty patterns. Uh, it, it's so, um, I, I, I don't, I'm trying to think out loud here. Um, no, that's, you're totally right. I, I mean, I have a whole like bulleted list in my head of way of thoughts on this and directions you could go and conclusions you could draw and ways you could rescue the paper mine and Mirko's that make it fit this in ways that maybe that maybe maybe it doesn't deserve to be rescued maybe this is right and showing we've gone in a wrong direction uh, so I, by the way i i don't I've, think i've like composed a talk in my head and i just well we should we should go through that i mean um this also this very similar set of questions and concerns that i had so here's some just notes i wrote here uh, one possibility, I, this is like one possibility, um, is that the, and I've talked about this before, is that 2D grid cell fields are an artifact. Um, they are a projection of fields that are somewhat random in 3D space. That's, that's what they're saying here. Um, I, I never thought, I just thought that, I've always felt that it's possible that uh, what we see as a 2D grid, uh, why can't I get this to come back up here? What we see as a 2D grid cell um, module is really not the whole story. Um, and, and we know that because of the, the cells that don't fire uh, reliably at different locations. We know that because we have to represent 3D space. So one general theme here is that what we think about as a 2D grid cell module is just a projection uh, of a bunch of something else uh, elsewhere. Um, uh, and um, uh, along those lines that, you know, if, if, they, if they were really random in 3D space, which is inconsistent with your paper, but if they're really random 3D spaces, these people projected, then perhaps path integration only occurs in 2D projection. Like you, you perform path integration in 2D, but the actual spacing of the, uh, the, the fields are, um, are, are just a projection of that. I, you know, I don't yeah, know. That, that's their paper. Well, that's but exactly they, don't, paper. they don't say that. By there, I mean oh. Marcus and Marco. Yeah, the path integration always happens in 2D, but it's projected in these random ways. And but I think space. in this case, I was saying something else. I was saying this is it, it occurs in 2D in the in one spot in the projection. Like remember, we have neural tissue that is two dimensional, right? And so um, there's a lot of constraints that puts on the system that there are certain things that can only be computed in a two dimensional system. And so this is not saying that. There's a bunch of 2D modules that are at, at different angles. I'm, this is a, my comment here is a different comment. My comment is that there is, is that, that there's only one place where path integration occurs. That is in the planar neural tissue. Uh, that's 2D. And so there's yeah, not that's like, exactly their paper. But I didn't think so. I thought I thought correct me. I thought that, I thought that your paper was that there are these different. 2D grid cell modules, but there are different planar angles to each other. No, no, they, they, uh, again, I, I shouldn't miss you, but you have 2D modules, they're fundamentally 2D, and path yes. integration occurs in 2D. Yes. Um, and it only occurs in these 2D modules, and that's the neural tissue, physical tissue. Um, but magically, if you were to project the positions, you know, rent in each module has some random projection to 3D, even though you're doing path integration in 2D, it still works in 3D through, because of the math. It still works even though it actually is only doing path integration in the 2D physical space in the layout. 
Um, right. So the path integration doesn't change. The module so you, still know have, that they're in 3D. If I have if I have two two grid cell modules that are inherently 2D, but they're yeah. they're laying on top of one another. I mean, they're they're both yeah. they're both physically planar. The cells they're physically planar, but at maybe different orientations and different scales. Let's say. Well, okay. Uh, right. The, the different modules would be the two modules would they wouldn't be exactly the same scale and orientation. They would be slightly different scales and orientation. That's what we've assumed all well, along. Well, that's, that's what we assumed all along, but how do I get the 3D aspect out of it? To me, to get the 3D aspect, I thought we had to have to say that those, those grid cell modules are, are, are representing, they're, they're, they're path integrating differently because they have to be at an angle to No, them. no, no. How do they, how do you? What do you, what do you mean at an angle? Pretty, what do you mean different angle at one another? It's, it's, all, it's all cortex, it's all 2D sheets. Uh, yeah, and it's just the only thing that they're varying is given a motor command. How do they move their bumps? Yes. Okay. That's it. That's it. the bottom line. That's it. Right. The bottom line is given a motor command. Some of these guys are going to move their bumps more, and some are going to move them less. Right. Depending on the yeah. orientation and the movement. Right. So I'm going to move one dimension. I'm going to move one unit in some direction. Well, some modules are going to change. Some won't change. Some will change a bit here, and all they all matter. Um, I'm trying to, I, I still, I'm struggling how to, I guess, how to do that in a, in a two-dimensional sheet of tissue. Um, how is it that some of these cells are going to, you know, that, that implies that, uh, okay, that implies so, that, so, um, you ahead. want me to try to explain that? Yeah, or, yeah, please do. So the, the module doesn't, it's all in 2D, it's a physical 2D sheet and it path integrates just like what we, the way we think. It doesn't really know anything about 3D space or 4D space or anything. Instead, what happens is when you make a 3D movement, that 3D movement vector is projected to some 2D movement vector so that you can move around in this 2D space, right? And so module one will have some random projection of the 3D movement into 2D and it's still gonna it path integrate in 2D. The module doesn't know it's okay. 3D. Uh, and the next module over will have a different random projection. Okay, so this now, all right, computing. this, I got it, I got it. This is very helpful. So prior to you sending this paper out, I was writing up notes for a problem I've been working on and I'm struggling with and I wanted help. Uh, and it gets exactly to this issue. The problem I was dealing with is to say, okay, I have a good sense for how columns, specifically mini columns, can learn to represent uh, a movement vector. Remember the whole mini con hypothesis I have that each of these, these complex cells are simply representing movement in some, in some direction. And the question then comes down to how is orientation integrated into this? So I, would, I was trying to solve a different problem. I was trying to solve the problem of how do I do a reference frame, a reference frame transformation? Given I have a set of movements in one, I have a set of movements of, of ego space, like my, I'm flexing my finger and I want to turn it into a movement vector in an object space like the coffee cup. And so I need to have some representation orientation and that representation orientation tells me how movement in one reference frame is going to change to movement in another reference frame. And I've been trying to figure out a neural mechanism for doing this and I'm struggling with it. This is, this is related, what you just told me here. I have now a set, of, a set of grid cells that are all laying in the same plane of the tissue and they actually represent, they represent different modules in the sense that how they respond to a movement vector varies, right? If I have a movement vector, some of these cells are gonna path integrate one way and some are gonna path integrate another way, but that way is gonna be dependent on the orientation um, variable. It's not, there's, cause that, that's important. You have to know the orientation. Yeah. So, so now the question comes, if, if you follow me, with the question comes, this is, okay, I've got a set of movement vectors that are in ego space. That's consistent, that's what it is. And now I have to do unique path integrations on different modules, grid cell modules that are coplanar based on an orientation. Yeah, and as long as every cell in that module responds, has that same kind of mapping, it, it will work. Yes, the, I get the trick it. Is, yeah. The trick now is, to, so what I was saying earlier, these modules at different angles to each other is now basically saying, oh, okay, not physically, they can be just physically coplanar, 
but their response due to movement have to be different angles to each other. Like they don't respond uniquely to, they don't respond the same to a movement vector. Some of them respond yeah. differently depending on the orientation. Exactly. Now, let me ask you how you think about but this. That could be for 1D modules too. I think it could work. Uh, yes. You know, you talked about yeah. 1D modules and the same trick could work for 1D. Yes. So now, the, okay, that makes it even harder to think about, but I do believe in 1D <laughs> modules. Um, I believe, I do believe, I do believe, I do believe in 1D modules. Um, so, so now the question, I have a question. When you're talking about this, are, imagine now I have a layer of grid cells in the tissue here. And some of them are gonna be um, responding differently based on the orientation to a movement. They're, they're all gonna get the same movement vector, but they're gonna respond differently. Are you imagining these different grid cell modules are interleaved into like every other cell might be a different orientation? Or do you imagine they're like, they're physically separated like, oh, like, like they are with spacing, like, uh, you know, the size of their, the, like, oh, there's a module over here onto the left that responds to one orientation and the module next to it responds to a different orientation and the module next to it responds to a different orientation. How would you imagine that? Are these intermingled or are they separated? These, these so you're just asking if this if the neurons are just kind of scrambled together into like a soup, or are they? Are well, they it wouldn't be separated? a soup. The, the question. Well, I wouldn't say they're random. Well, I just say are they interleaved? Um, they could be interleaved. I think it'd be they could be interleaved, but it's simpler if they're not because the path integration, the connections, the physical connections that allow the path integration should be all within a module. So I guess they could be interleaved, but then those connections would be like crossing over one another physically. Yeah. Like within a module, you have all of these, you'd have all of these lateral connections or recurrent connections that do the actual path integration. And that, that uh, topology has to be preserved regardless of whether yeah. they are interleaved or not. What if, what if we said we had 1D modules that were corresponding to, to meaning columns? Yeah. And, um, and so now it's much easier for you to imagine I could have, okay. Remember we talked about slabs? So like in V1, you have a set of mini columns that all have the same basic uh, quote receptor field. They're aligned in a slab. And then the next uh, set of mini columns, the next slab overall have a different orientation and so on. Um, those, I could have a set of mini columns that all respond to the same movement, but the difference between the, the mini columns in that slab could be orientation. Um, so, they're all saying, yeah, we're, they're all basically along a slab. You're basically you you uh, you have a changing of orientation. This is not the orientation like uh, like a like a receptive field orientation. This is the orientation that is um, dynamically determined, like head direction. So <laughs> it's such a different orientation. It's it's the it is the it is it is the the, the, the it is the the factor we have to use to say well, how should a movement. You know, a movement in ego space affect this column, this this one D grid cell module based on an orientation uh, that could work. Um, so I don't like the idea that you have these multiple modules of spatially aligned, like like two D modules, like in the entorhinal cortex, because there's just not enough of them. You know, there's just never enough two D grid cell modules in the entorhinal cortex. You know, we we need lots of them, and um, and just you know a, a couple of two or three or four is just never enough. So um, so the idea that again now we're now we're going back to um, I'm starting thinking out loud here, but we're going back to I'm going back to the idea that okay, let's say we have a set of uh, mini comms that represent 1D modules. Those modules are all um, uh, those uh, um, each one is 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 basically they all responding to the same imp motor input, but they are varying. Each one's getting a different orient. Uh, each one has a different orientation projection to it in some sense, and then they update each other um, appropriately. All right, I'm, I'm going to go with that. I don't know if, if, if people follow that up, but I think you did. But um, I'm going to think about that. Um, um, this might help me with my other problem. <laughs> Clarity. Uh, all right, that's all I had to say about this paper. <laughs> so, so one thought, one thought with this paper, and to not not coming from the angle of the per paper I did with Marco and Ela. Uh, but instead, just I'm sorry, Ella, if she's listening. I meant to mention her in the paper too. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So, so um, for the first thought that comes to mind when I see this is one way to to rescue the idea of grid cells 
performing metric operations here is to say that um, sometimes we talk about maybe grid cells are actually a readout of something else. They're actually performing a readout on a set of 1D modules or a yes. set of or sometimes you call them, we, sometimes we'd say velocity controlled oscillators and grid cells are actually just a readout of those. And, um, and that is one way to, you know, rescue the idea of entorhinal cortexes and cortex in general as performing fundamentally metric operations is to say grid cells are just part of the readout of the, of the, lo of the location code. They is that are the same, the as, is that the same as when I say they're just a projection of the real thing? Uh, Probably, okay. yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, like, just if wanna... you consider if you consider going from the 1D modules or the velocity controlled oscillators, and you want to reach a point where place cells can read them out, maybe grid cells are just like an intermediate stage in that readout. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, that that's one way to to go about like to to to. Anyway, that that is that is one of the ideas, but is not. Um, let's see. Uh, I'll say two things about it. Uh, this paper. Is compatible with that idea. On the other hand, that idea is a little bit hand wavy, and it's being um, almost anti-scientific. It's just coming up with another explanation. Like eventually, you want to find proof for this mechanism. It's kind of um, anyway. It's, it's being unfalsifiable. It's running away because you want this theory. Because we, we want this theory of metric operations. Well, work. it's I mean, so, as, as theorists, we're allowed to do that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> up to a point, right? Okay, I'll keep going. Uh, so, so anyway, that's that is like w w seeing this this paper. If anything, it pushes me more in that direction of the grid cells as readouts, uh, and that suddenly the all of this makes sense and is coherent. Um, so, so I, I, I just want to add that I agree with you. I'm not sure I understand what exactly what you mean by readout, but it, 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 I agree with you in the some sense. I always thought that grid cells were not the right answer. They were they were like a, this artifact along the way, and. Um, because I felt that grid cells that modules have to be one dimensional. And I felt, you know, there's all these other things that they have to do. We just, and there's not enough grid cell modules. So I think we're in agreement about that. I, yeah. When I read this paper, it said to me, okay, this is helpful to think about. It's supporting that idea, right? So I'm, I'm just saying I'm agreeing with you on that. Yeah. So, okay, that's one, that's one like bundle of thoughts. Uh, second bundle of thoughts would be, um, so on the other hand, the idea of, grid cells as being a fundamental circuit and cortex that is fundamentally 2D and, 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 and like the idea that our brains actually operate on, two, on mapping things into 2D spaces um, is, is, still, is still interesting and I don't want to just throw it out because I mean that's, that's of course the, one of the key ideas of the paper I did with Mirko and Ela and um, so I don't know you could you could rescue that idea with this paper in a couple different ways. One we've talked about is that like, um, and we actually had a figure and it, here actually, can I share my screen and just show? Sure, sure. Let me just stop. I'm gonna stop. Uh, sure. So you'll have to stop. Yeah. Yeah. But wait, I remember when when you were we were reviewing your paper, um, I kept coming back. I believe saying, "Hey, isn't this consistent with one D two? Can this all work in one D?" And I think you said yes. So yeah. I'm not sure why you feel you need to rescue it because I don't think the core of your paper was 2D. The core of your paper was an idea that could work in any dimensional. True. I, I would say I'd say I'd say the, the paper had kind of two bets, and one of them is that it works in any dimensions. Two is that like we, we also did emphasize 2D. So so the paper would be more right if it were if the 2D thing were correct. But um so 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 um the, the paper you just presented, and, and I should disclaim that like. The, the the results you just showed in that paper they'd been showing them in talks up to that point and we knew about it as we wrote this paper oh, so like that. so so like we ahead of time we're trying to kind of decide how is this theory compatible with this um with this data and and one thing we pointed out you've you've kind of alluded to it one one thing that we pointed out is that if you have um neurons that read out from two modules um you'll uh, uh if you have neurons that read out from two modules you, get you would elongated. get firing fields like this and yeah. they'd be yeah they'd be kind of elongated and kind of not uniform uh they let's see they're spatially an interesting pattern but they're not spatially regular in the traditional sense like they're why, why they're, wouldn't they be if i took a if i took a, a regular set of columns like your picture on the left there 
and another regular set of columns. And I just sort of angled them together a little bit and then looked at the intersection. Wouldn't there be a regular intersectional pattern? Uh, they... I'd say they're regular by some definitions of regular, but not, uh, not uh, but it's gonna be sometimes really fancy patterns that uh, that aren't. Okay. I mean, that's that's going to be the best answer I can give right now. Let me ask you this. This is for might be that you need to look at a really large space before yeah. you notice the regularity. Uh -huh. In a small space, you might not see it. Is this is this from your paper? This figure? Yeah. I don't re I don't recall D and uh, D on in your paper. Was that added later? Yes, it was one of the later figures we did. I don't think I saw that. I got to go yeah. read it again. Yeah, this this was this was a nice insight from Mirko when he showed this because. Um, because this this figure really shows two different things. It, it illustrates how you can um, how you can decode locations with more and more modules better, but it also illustrates what you would what cells firing fields would look like if they're conjunctive representations of two modules. Mm -hmm. And yeah. in some sense, these this m equals two almost kind of sort of resembles the fields you've showed. Yeah, it, yeah. It, maybe there 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 are links between them and. Uh, so, so anyway, um, in this core idea, you could, you could, you could, you could, mis you could take this core idea and flesh it out a little bit more to explain this data. For example, if, uh, if grid cells have some crosstalk between modules where like, if, 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 if I'm module, if you have one module, another module, another module, if the middle one is receiving some input from the ones next to it that modulate its firing rate, you'll get something like this. Uh, and it, suddenly that could explain the, the data from these results. Mm. Uh, uh, there, I just wanted to lay out that there, there are a set of ways that you can, um, that you could still explain this, but, it, but I, but I will say, of course, that the, the um, it would have been great for our theory if the paper you just demonstrated had had just these beautiful diagonal column columnar um, firing fields, and it seems that it's not as simple as that. Like it, it's, it, it definitely seems like um, the paper you just presented was not a strong vote in favor of this model, but it's still kind of competitive. Well, again, I, I think the savory here is if we don't, if we think of those, if we think of the blobs, what they're calling, uh, you know, the the, the grid fields are really the intersection of other grid fields. And if you think of it that way, then, then maybe you don't have to throw anything out. I mean, it's, yeah, right? Um, yeah. All right, I, you know, this, this yeah. whole thing about these, I don't remember this figure, so I have to read your paper again, sorry. This is like, it's like, oh, this looks really good. <laughs> Here's a technical question about the but, paper, if I, if I could. Uh, in, in your paper, you had a bunch of these kind of linear mappings from ND to 2D or ND to 1D, right? But I think yeah. the core idea would work even if it was not linear. It could be, you know, some bizarro random nonlinear mapping as long as it's fixed. If all the cells in the module have the same random mapping, you should still be able to recover these, uh, get the coding properties, right? The linearity is not that critical, is it? Which, which what linearity are you talking about exactly? Uh, saying that the grid field module has to be in some sort of plane, you know, normal plane or not normal, but like a regular angle at some angle projected into what would it, in like a linear if, way. If it wasn't, what would it mean that, uh, what would it be if it wasn't regular or? <laughs> it could be anything. It could be anything. Uh, it could be like- How, how would, how, how, it, how does, so, so how does path like, integration uh, work? It, it would, well, path integration just works in 2D. It, it's uh, the 2D module, nothing's changed about the 2D module. It does path integration, but the way you map the, the three-dimensional motion vector down to the 2D doesn't, and what I'm asking is that doesn't really have to be a linear mapping. It could be some, you know, somewhat distorted kind of non-linear thing as what long as saying? all the cells in the module have the same mapping. I you're think saying the mapping from a motive, a motive vector to the, to the movement? Yeah. The, so yeah. so what, give me, any, can you just visually paint a picture of like what a non-linear mapping between motor and a grid cell would be? <laughs> just trying to picture Well, that. linear I'm, mapping would be, you know, if you, um, 
I, if I move a <laughs> centimeter, I, <laughs> if I move a centimeter in some direction, um, uh, I mean, to me, the assumption is if, if I'm okay. at any, if loca you move any a location, in some, if you move in some line in 3D, it could move in some curve in 2D. Think of it that way. It doesn't have to move in a line. That would mean that there's that the mapping between a particular motor direction uh, movement is, and the 2D. It would, it would, would that means that 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 uh, that there's a sort of a distortion. Uh, like if I move a centimeter and my, my finger moves a centimeter uh, in some direction, um, the, it, where how far it moves in the object's reference frame would would vary depending on my like on my location. I mean, be like well, that's true for linear too. That's not a linear, nonlinear thing. That's true for linear too. That the scale would be different. But yeah, the scale saying, would be different, but it's always given a particular. I mean, given a particular orientation, I expect the same movement to result in the same movement in the in the object space. I mean, it's like, um, right? Or, I mean, either I, I imagine the grid cells representing some sort of three dimensional grid around an object, and and I and I imagine that well, grid is 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 is. It doesn't have to be rectilinear, but it has to be regular, like the, the, the spacing between equal points and spacing between the, the bars and the grid have to be the same. It's like I can't distort it. Otherwise, path integration wouldn't work. I right? think it can be distorted with that, and path integration can still work. But then wouldn't I have to learn, depending on where I am, how far to move? I mean, if I move. No, 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 because the trick is that the path integration is only in 2D. It never happens in 3D. It, everything happens in 2D. You're just mapping, temporarily mapping the 3D to 2D, doing the integration and mapping it back to 3D. There's no, everything only happens in 2D um, or 1D, whatever, but, uh, but uh, it never- I'm, I'm, I'm so confused about that because now you're saying I'm mapping 3D to 2D and then back again. That's not what's going on in, 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 in this paper, right? Um, the, the Marcus Murdoch well, kind paper. Of, well, is it? Okay, we should let Marcus speak. <laughs> so I guess my short answer is I only know how to make this work with linear mappings. Uh, Why is that? Because that's, I mean, the definition of a linear mapping, that means um, that's like, if I'm moving at one meter per second, the bump, if I move at one meter per second versus if I move at two meters per second. Uh, yeah. Uh, you want the bump to move, you know, twice as fast. You, 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 you yes. Want, uh, <laughs> the bump and, has to move twice. Yeah, yeah. And if you break that assumption, I think uh, this model, yeah, yeah, yeah. this as is, is not going to have. Well, well, think of it this way: the the matrix that that's mapping the movement vector to two D, let's say it's from three D to two D, has yeah. takes x y z and outputs x and y. Yeah. Right. That mapping, imagine if it's some neural network with hidden layers instead of a matrix, yeah. right? And, and it's still consistent. It's all fixed. Every cell in the module is still behaving in a consistent manner. It's just bizarre that the mapping will, could be some you know, curve and things like that. Um, but as long as it's consistent and different for each module, it seems like you could still recover the code the locations you could un you could you could have a network that learns the code right information okay. is preserved could i give you a, a thought experiment that might help is um, this related to what i was just saying yes so imagine you as an adult someone gives you a pair of glasses that distorts the world so that everything's nonlinear now but they hold up a ruler and in that space, you see, you, you somehow know that the graduations are still in some kind of regular spacing with respect to each other. Well, are they or are they distorted? No, no. The, the, you perceive them as distorted, yeah. but physically, yeah. you know, it's a reference. Yeah. So you could learn how to navigate that space over time to understand what that distortion was as long as you have a consistent feedback. Now... For humans, we don't have that ruler, but we have the physical world, the motion, the touch, you know, you know, how long it takes me to do something. So as long as things are topologically connected as they were in the real world, you could learn this nonlinear mapping of how things Yeah, I guess I guess that's right. But but the thing I'm trying to avoid, I think the whole point yeah, is I you, think could, that's true. you that's, could learn a yeah, nonlinear mapping. 
yeah, well, the trick here is you, you can learn the non, but the trick here is you don't need to learn the non. Well, you don't, you don't well, want to learn the non. The point, is, the point is, is that you, you, you just substituted in a neural network for that, which is what they are good for. They can learn nonlinear mappings. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, but you, I, the, the trick here, you, you don't need to learn the nonlinear mapping. You, but, you, everything is done in 2D. Uh, all the interesting stuff is done in 2D. Uh, you, you, you just take some random mapping and project it to 2D, but you don't need to learn what that mapping well, is. Well, you don't it's have just, to go back and forth is the point, which is what your, your analysis is. It, it's basically, as long as your feedback is similarly distorted, you know, so that you, you get the, if I want to go from, if I want to move my hand from point A to point B, you know, all I need is the instructions to get me from there. The fact that my eye is now showing something weird, you know, is something that goes away in time because you learn what the real distortion is. I'm just saying that all this is presumably learned, you know, at, at some level. Well, so, I, you don't, I, so you don't have to, you don't have to construct these artificial spaces. You just have to say, no, you, you don't. Know, you do. You don't want to learn each one individually. That's the trick. That's the beauty. I, I, I think that's what, what happens. Uh, that's what happens within within the embryo. I, I think you're talking about something different. Uh, okay. I, I, no. I, 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 I don't think we I don't, am. We don't want to learn nonlinear mappings. The brain can't. We, we have to have regular systems that to handle these new environments, right? So, although we could learn nonlinear mappings, I don't think we can learn enough of them. No, I, it was it was it was a thought experiment. The, yeah, the, I got it. I got it. I think I think I get it, but. I think it's but all, all you need is adjacency. All you well, need to do is something is adjacent to something else. And then as long as you get feedback that this is next to this, you can, it's not so much, you know, learning an arbitrary thing. That's really, you know, you, that's, that, that's why you can have this nonlinear space and it's consistent. Yeah. You, topology, think, not geometry. I think you're right. Uh, I'm not sure that's that's what's going on. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not disagreeing <laughs> with the statement. I'm just saying your statement is not correspond to what I'm saying. <laughs> All right. It's a different statement. <laughs> you know, one way to think about this, the way I was thinking about it early uh, last night, I guess, was it's like, if I want to figure out how to get from point A to point B in some space, can I calculate that right up front? Or do I have to walk through sequence by sequence, step by step to get from point A to point B. Meaning, can I literally say the whole, the linearity to me is, a, is sort of this, and the, and the whole grid cell module concept says, hey, I can get from any point to any point, calculate the vector to get me there because I assume everything is regular. Everything, all these spacings, all the grid cell modules are regular and all this stuff. If, if there was distortions in it, it seems to me, well, I might still be able to get there, but I have to sort of wander through you know the distorted fields in moment to moment and say oh, well if i go forward now it's going to take me here and i go forward now it's going to take me there so anyway I don't, that's, I don't, that well me. i think that's what a baby does i don't know i think i think uh i don't know i would agree with that i mean hope the, yeah i don't know hey i, I have a I, we, we're getting late here well I, we, I, don't, I don't want to shut down the conversation um uh but i do think um there's a lot of good ideas came up here and um I would want, I'm going to go back and read the Ilya Marco and Marcus paper again <laughs> because you guys got some new figures in there that I didn't see. Um, 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 well, Marcus, I think it'd be cool if you showed the picture from that other talk. Uh, sure. Oh, I think yeah. Oh, yeah. Like Jeff missed it. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. It, it's loosely connected to this, so I can do that. Let me bring it up. It'll take me five seconds to find it because I don't want to show you our slide. Yeah, black window. I'm, I'm going to watch that keynote you talked about, uh, Subutai. Is that a machine learning talk or is it a neuroscience and machine learning talk? There's no neuroscience in it. It's about bias and machine learning uh, and some of the societal problems okay. and how we go about address it as a community. But it's a really, really well done talk. It's okay. amazingly well done. Okay, I'll, I'll listen to <laughs> um, it. it. It gives me ideas of how we might want to have a video about the the thousand base theory. Mm. We could talk about that later. Okay, yeah. uh, it's really yeah. Okay, it's a long talk though, so yeah. it's, that's the problem. So uh, yeah, there's this paper from, um, it, or sorry, there's a talk by uh, here, uh, just to make sure I get the, the name totally right, because I haven't, I haven't read his work before, but, uh, but he works with, the, with Moser Dater, Benjamin Dunn, uh, and the, he, he gave a, a talk um, that showed some new, uh, some new data from the Moser lab. Uh, and, but the first thing I just want to emphasize is what NeuroPixel allows them to do. Um, they can they can in a single rat record 124 grid cells 
in a single grid cell module uh, and, and, and get, get those maps from, uh, get, get the rate maps for 124 cells <laughs> concurrently. Mm. Uh, and so um, this on its own is just like a discussion topic is like, first of all, I didn't even know that, I, I wasn't confident that a grid cell module even had 124 cells that are sufficiently grid-like to be considered grid cells. I mean, we did, we, we, we've been wondering how many there are. The fact that a single, that a neuropixel can, can detect 124. Remind me, the neuropixel, is this an optical technique or is this an approach? It's, it's, a, no, it's, it's electrophysiology. Electrophysiology. Okay. Yeah. And are they all on the same plane or is it possible they're catching grittiness in different layers of the, of the tissue? I think it's different layers. Uh, it but can I, be because, uh, yeah, yeah, because they're different. Each probe has has an extent yeah, to it, and yeah. the cells could be anywhere along there. I think so. It, 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 when you say they're all on the same module, it's an interesting question. What you know, because many people think a module does not span multiple layers. That they would say um, they would they would only record in a single layer uh, optically or something like. Yeah, that. I guess that's uh, like the question that came to mind immediately is how do they know they're all in the same module. <laughs> But they, they're, well, we they're basing it on scale. I mean, scale on and scale. orientation okay. is okay. Well, that's not the, okay. okay. But that's a different definition of module than some other people use because some yep. people they would say, oh, you know, there's these like I think some cells don't show the phase procession or something like that, and those are in different layers than other cells, and and but they all have the same spacing. Uh, they're all in the same vertically aligned. Uh, okay. Um, but that's so, really cool technique. Uh, yeah. So, like, I mean, this is a whole. Um, I don't know. That's a whole discussion topic of its own. We have we have some new data on uh, on how many ballpark figure how many grid cells cells are in a module. Uh, of course, what do I mean by module? Yeah. It's across different layers. Um, but even just like looking at this, you see some diversity. How some of them are like you know a very contrasting blue background with green uh, bumps, and others of these are very quite green background. And suddenly I want to know what layers these different ones were in. Because yeah. some, something that has come up before is um, some grid cells might be more like predictive or more anticipatory. Like if the rat's thinking about where it might go next, maybe some of its grid cells kind of simulate this while others are not simulating forward. And you can imagine the ones with the green backgrounds are simulating forward and the ones with the blue backgrounds aren't. I, I'm just making stuff up, but like it yeah. raises a set of interesting questions. Um, so, so that that on on its own is is nice, and I guess just I'll show one other part from the talk, one slide. So I guess I'll show you. I'm going to stop sharing this and just show a freeze frame on YouTube. Uh, so in this experiment, it, I assume you can see YouTube with the slide, mm -hmm. um, and so so basically they they handled three different scenarios. They they recorded during three different. The tasks, or one of the tasks is sleeping, if you can call it test. And, <laughs> and um, so one of them is the most familiar one um, is, you know, navigating a 2D environment. The second one, um, you're going to just have to imagine in your head what this maze looks like, but you can kind of tell from looking at the rate map that, uh, that it's like a, a rat walking through kind of a maze, kind of 1D, kind of 2D. Uh, and, uh, and they're, they're, and then the third, of course, is sleeping. And um, an interesting result is that um, that the grid cells, um, they maintain their phase to phase relationships in every every situation they threw at the rats, whether it's like the 2D clean it place, the, the 1D maze that's kind of 2D or, or even sleeping, the, the correlations between cells, sleeping is kind of complicated, but at least you can look at these two. The correlations between the cells were kind of consistent where it seemed like this 2D phase map was preserved even in this messy environment. Uh, and it, I guess um, what this suggests or what it, um, what it kind of reinforces, the idea it reinforces is that when the grid cells are distorted, when the grid fields are distorted, they do so in kind of a coherent way where all of the cells in a module are distorted together in a way that it is, it is still kind of essentially a 2D map that's being stretched and distorted in different ways. Well, that's directly tied to what we were saying earlier. Yeah. yeah. I'm, not, I'm not following it too well. I, 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 like I'm trying to go in between the left in the middle image and I'm kind of confused here. I mean, you're not saying that that, that, that little array is plopped on top of that wheel thing, is it? Or, or 
Are, are you, or are you saying the phase? No, no I'm, I'm saying the, the wheel thing is like a distorted version of this. And by the way, if they of course did this statistically with tons and tons of grid cells, and so I'm not summarizing I, it well. I don't, know how to, I don't know how you distort that to get to the other one. I mean, it, it, these are very different, uh, you know, um, surfaces and stuff you know what i'm saying it's like, yeah uh, i guess i'd have to hear the talk i, I don't just, I, yeah. don't, I don't understand what's going on there um so uh, i really didn't try to do a good job of summarizing this talk here other i wanted to get the neuropixel point apart uh, uh, neuropixel idea across and i just wanted to echo there uh, that they have some data that says that grid cell modules seem to kind of stay coherent and distort together I could do a better job of actually so, presenting so can, that. Can you can you put a picture in my mind what that means? They stay together, but they just they, they stick with human, but they distort together. Yeah, I mean, here uh, like using examples from previous experiments. For example, like the the trapezoid. Yes. Uh, what, uh, what their data suggests is that even in these messy s situations where the grid cells are compressed and weird, um, there still are you know, modules accounting for every phase between this bump and this bump. And the population as a whole seems to be distorting uh, as opposed to this being some, um, sometimes when people model grid cells, they do it using, uh, they, they'll say that grid cells are just principal components of location or something like that. And, and that just lays out a totally different mental model for, for grid cells. Uh, so uh, in the case, in the case so, of the trapezoidal room, what you're saying is like, hey, I'm, I'm taking this module and I'm stretching it in a couple of dimensions. And um, so the spacing between the fields grows, but it's all being consistent across all the Yeah, so cells. it's it's really a population of cells working together. Uh, so I it's to, easier, to, easier to see that with the trapezoid than with like a circular track or the wagon wheel track. You know, that's, that's hard yeah. to imagine how that stretches to fit in that. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know what that means to stretch a you know, this is a trapezoid, I can like at least imagine, oh yeah, I'm stretching in two dimensions, you know. I guess one answer would be uh, I, either in the hairpin maze or the tra or, or the or the wagon wheel track. Um, does it, it, do all trajectories seem to be, uh, do, do all paths, do all paths of the rat coincide with, uh, with, with straight lines in the, um, the, in the rhombus? Do, do they, do they and, correspond? And are they saying they do? Yes, basically, yes. Okay, oh. I, I am I'm compressing this. I'm over compressing this talk right now. Okay, uh, okay. So right. so that like the main thing I want, the most interesting thing I was like, oh, I need to share this neuropixel thing. Okay. And and by the way, this idea of grid cell modules kind of um, um, distorting together is also a nice observation that they kind of have some data backing up. Mm, okay. That's that's the that's the summary that I'm giving. I, well, the, the although I think the was... latter thing is much more interesting. Uh, it, yeah. is, I mean, the neuropixel is interesting too, but I kind of knew about that. And that's uh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, in the, the end, fact it... that the, the the property that they're all distorting together is really cool, uh, and you need that for the coding stuff that we we rely on. Um, yeah. yeah, and it, it, it's cool. Uh, once again, I I kind of winged this. I just I watched this a couple nights ago and decided to just show something real quick. Okay. But to, to, just the idea that everything can be backed like they can record so many grid cells in all the different rooms and anyway, it's it's just it is cool. Yeah, that's very cool. All right, and and connecting it back to the the other topic, it, uh, um, one of the big questions of grid cells is. Um, is it fundamentally a 2D sheet that is being stretched over different things, whether that thing be, you know, wagon wheel mazes or 3D space? And the thing I just showed kind of, it didn't contradict the results you showed, but there's certainly not a unifying theory right now that, that incorporates so, those. I, I'm going to keep working on the idea that everything is really one dimensional. And um, everything's one dimensional. And then the two dimensional properties are sort of an artifact that for some reason that we see them that way. And um, because I don't know, I'm just stating how I'm gonna take this because I think so many things, if that's right, and there's, there's a lot of reasons to believe that would be right. If that's right, then so many of the interpretations of the 2D spaces is it's just, you're just not gonna get it right. You're gonna, 
you're going to be trying to interpret this projection or interpret this uh, artifact as opposed to the, tr the true thing that's going on. Um, so I, mean, I just put that as a cautionary note. You know, I read these things and I'm like, I don't know if I believe, two I don't believe that the story of grid cells being two dimensional modules. I just don't believe it. <laughs> um, I think it's an artifact of some sound. So um, anyway, but I got, this is a great, great talk today. This really helped me out. I, I wanted to talk about these topics from a different point of view and, uh, but at least uh, we got a lot of stuff going. It was really great for me today at least. Um, Okay, I'm going to need to sign off before my, our next yeah. meeting in 10 yeah, minutes. Yeah, we, we got 10 minutes. <laughs> and I, I have to go read your paper again, Marcus. <laughs> you, got, you, you modified it since the last time I read it. So my mistake. All right. I should have read yeah. it. See ya. Bye. All right. See you guys in a bit.